I saw another angel fly in the midst of heaven, having the everlasting gospel to preach unto them that dwell on the earth and to every nation and kindred and tongue and people. All right, if you can, if possible, kneel with me in prayer. Precious Father, it is so important that we ask for your presence. In the day that which we live, in wickedness, Lord, we need thee every second of every day. So please pour your Holy Spirit like never before upon us. Let us not leave from this campground, from this camp meeting, the same as we came, wretched and miserable, blind and naked. But Father, help us to be empowered, to be true children of the Most High God. Be with those that are still on their way. Press upon those that need to be here, because these messages are not just for us, but as Pastor Raphael said, this is for others that are our future brothers and sisters. God and direct us, forgive us where we have failed thee but make us more than conquerors. In Jesus' name, amen. You know, men's hearts are failing for them for why? For fear of which things are coming upon the earth, correct? Why? Are you fearful of what's coming up on the earth? No. We shouldn't fear. Great peace have they which, and nothing shall offend them. We know, we should know, we should be prepared. If we're not, if we're scared, it's because we're not grounded in the Word of God. Yes. And so if we're grounded in the Word of God, these things are not going to affect us or offend us. We're going to move forward. Yes, we're going to see loved ones. Those of you that you church with someone, someone that hurts you, you should be crying because you fall in love with them, right? Or do you not fall in love with them? You do or you don't? We should be falling on with him. And this, this is why this is important in the day in which we live in is to understand that we, it's necessity of us knowing how Satan is going to use the church to destroy the church. That's why where his attack is is within this church right here or wherever, whatever church you may be going to. Correct? Are we immune to it? Listen to this, and I'm hoping you're taking notes. Do you want me to preach present truth or pleasant truth? Do you want me to preach you a warm message or a warning message? Because if not, Pastor Raphael, I'm going to go back home. There we go. I'm laying it out. So if you want present truth, I'm going to give you present truth, not pleasant truth. Living in heaven with saints we don't know, oh, that will be glory. But listen, living on earth with saints we do know, well, that's a different story. We all want to go to heaven, don't we? And it's going to be so glorious, but we can't get along here on earth with one another. This is when the little packet there you can order as well. It's called, you know, how the, Satan uses the church to destroy the church. Manuscript 14. Take notes. Don't come. Don't ever. You, you're a student. You're here, we're here to learn. That's why I give you notes and stuff. That's why I give people notes because they need to know. Satan, manuscript 14, pages 160, 161 uh, says, Satan will so mingle his deceptions with truth that side issues will create, will be created to turn the attention of the people from the great issue. How many of you have side issues in your church? Yeah. The test to be brought upon the people of God in these last days is going to be side issues. Everyone who has heard and accepted the third angel's message is to hold the banner of truth unstained and uncorrupted higher and still higher. Why are we lowering the standards to accommodate people? My question to you and that I've asked before my church and I've asked several other churches is 
Can you take the heat from persecution? If not, then get out of the way. Because this is a live warfare. Get out of the way. You're in the, you're in the way of this warfare. If we can't handle walking in the truth, how are you going to handle running with the footman? How are you going to handle the footman first? Because then when the horses come, how are you going to be able to run with the horses? See, this is why we have to understand this. Manuscript page 20, um, uh, uh, volume two, 20, page 175, says Satan has come down in great wrath, knowing that his what? He has a short time. He will work with all deceivableness and unrighteousness, says those who, are, who in their past experience have had great light, but have not cherished that light nor purified their souls by obeying the truth will meet with great loss. If you had an experience once, that you can't rely on that vast experience, can you? You have to rely on fresh, every day, every second experience, correct? You can't look back at your past. You can say, thank God that God has brought me and I understand at this point or points but today I need a refreshing from Him. Will every member of the Seventh-day Adventist Church now search his own heart? Quit looking at me or each other to see if you rank up to me. You understand? Quit doing that. Quit looking, as we're told in Matthew chapter 7, looking at the speck in somebody else's high when we have the lumber yard in our own yard. I. Correct? And make earnest, thorough work of repentance. Amen. Whenever a man places his own wisdom or wealth or, or power to, con to control in the place where God should be, he is on the losing side. Thus saith the Lord, let not the wise man glory in his wisdom, neither let the mighty man glory in his might, let not the rich man glory in his riches, but let him that glorify, glory what? In this, that he understandeth and, what's the next word? Knoweth. I never knew you, Ben. That knoweth me that I am the Lord. See, do you know him as your personal Savior. Testimonies, Volume 5, page 672, paragraph 1. Listen closely. Listen what Satan's plan is for you and for me. It is Satan's plan to, number one, weaken the faith of God's people where? You know this quote? In the Testimonies. Now, back in December, I was impressed. I was in Loma Linda at, at Harold Cortez's church preaching, and I got up and said, you know, and I want to ask you this question. How many of you have the testimonies to the church? Shame on the rest of you, and I say this in love. How many of you have read all nine volumes to the testimonies? Shame on you, those that have not. I called upon that church and I came back to my church. I'm not belittling them. I'm just saying we've got to be real. And it was Sabbath afternoon. There was about 80 people. And I asked that question. Six people raised their hands and said, I've got all nine. Four people said, I've, only, I've read them through. So I challenged. I sent the challenge to everyone that I knew, minister, and said, you know, this year, this work on reading all nine testimonies, 13 and a half pages a day. And by January the 3rd that I calculated, I did this little, you know, little sheet and everything else, you will have read all nine volumes. Well, guess what had been going on? There are people in my church that are realizing, especially when they got in volume two, between the 250 and 400 range, I'm not even ready for heaven. And they're good people. Wonderful people. And they're realizing, I'm not ready to go to heaven. I still have defects in my character. Because it says it's the testimonies for who? Who's the church, by the way? 
Yes. Those of you that are just sitting there not saying anything is because you want to refuse that there's, uh, there's nothing wrong in me, right? That person over here is the one that really needs the testimonies, correct? See, it's Satan's plan to weaken the faith of God's people in the testimonies. If we don't, are not in the testimonies, yes, I, I, trust me, I'm the first one to admit, I struggle with the testimonies, okay? Is that okay to say that? Yeah, I'm confessing. Because it steps all over my toes, all the way through my face, but I know that I need those because I need to know what defects of characters that I have in me that need to be overcome. Because right now we're playing the game of life. We're not seeing. This is why we're not evangelizing. How many have invited somebody to come to camp meeting this, today, this weekend? Do you understand? I asked this question in Washington two years ago. And I said, I don't know if I'll be here next year. I said, but please invite. Well, guess what? This past year I was invited to come back and I asked the same question. So I'm going to ask you all. How many, if God permits, when you all have your camp meeting next year, how many of you are going to diligently ask others and try to bring them to camp meeting? Okay, hold on. You better put, put your hand back down. Because guess what? There's a recording angel, uh, angel in heaven that says, <laughs> Pastor Ben raised his hand, and he's going to hold me accountable to it, right? So I'm, how many of you are going to diligently Covenant with God and say, God, by God's grace, I'm going to invite and I'm going to try to bring some ones and more than ones next year. See, if we covenant with God, then God's going to answer our prayer. Because we're doing everything we can. Because, see, we as Seventh-day Adventists are hoarders. We want to hoard the, the message, don't we? we want to, but we don't want to share with anyone else. But and I've seen this time and time again where, you know, we sit in church and say amens and everything else. And then when someone else does bring them a, a new member to the church, even not of our faith, then it's, oh, well, thank you very much, Pastor. Now I, I, I'll, I'll witness to them. Is that true? I know. You guys won't want me to come back. That's okay. Love y'all. See, weaken the faith in the testimony. Satan knows how to make his attacks. He works upon minds to excite jealousy. There, see, there's jealous people in our church. I announced for a couple of months, I, I did not announce to even my own church about this property that you all just saw until about two weeks ago. And guess what happened when I announced? I said, I just want to let you all know um, that the Lord has provided and we're waiting and, and we, we have, my wife literally packed our place on January, by January 5th of this year, our whole place was packed in boxes. Because we were told in 30 days we were going to close and so man, my wife, you know, um, there's a long story with that, but anyways, the reason why, but she was packed and we were eating out of paper plates and everything else. We're going to be moving soon, praise God. Guess what? Have we moved? No. So I announced about two weeks, two and a half weeks ago to my church, and I said, you know, I just want to let you all know that, um, you know, we're praying and working uh, about this house that God's providing so we can do the lifestyle work. And I noticed when I said that, there was one person, individual, that was very uncomfortable, was jealous because I said that. Now, I went later and said, this home is not me. The 5,000 square foot house, you know, that's, that's a nice number, isn't it? But that's not me. I, I'm, I'm okay. That little room where I'm staying, my son and I are staying, we, we, my, my wife and my other daughter, youngest daughter, we've stayed in places like that, and that was the happiest we were ever, ever was. I don't need a big place. I only need it to be able to serve God and to help people. Amen. 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 So see, there's jealousy. In minds to excite jealousy, that's number two. Number three, dissatisfaction toward those at the head of the world. People that are ahead, you know, and Pastor Ben, I can do a better job than he does. Or that elder over here, he doesn't know what he's talking about. If, if they get me up to teach the Sabbath school class, I, I, I would know what to say. Right? Dissatisfaction. Number four, 
the gifts are next question. Gifts. Then, of course, they have a little weight and instruction given through vision is disregarded, which is number five that I've numerated on here. Number six, next follows skepticism in regard to the vital points of our faith. Well, you know, I was going to show you some. One of them is the little horn of Daniel 7.1. 725. Now they're saying that it is an Antiochus Epiphany within the Adventist Today online magazine. That is now that, well, we, we misunderstood. Seriously? Who is this little horn of Daniel 725? The papacy. See? Uh, and also the Advent Today re- published a 2011 article about what we used to understand the papacy as the Antichrist. We need to let them off the hook. How many of you read that article? Uh, come on, raise your hand. Don't, yeah. All right, I did too. I was shocked. I'm like, dude, what? We're going to let them off the hook? We love the people, don't we? The Catholic people. It's the system. We love the Seventh-day Adventist people, don't we? It's the system that we're against, Correct. Yes, okay? So here we're starting to break down the vital points of our faith. What's the four pillars of our faith, by the way? Sabbath, the sanctuary, the state of the dead, and the three angels' messages. See, I always, I always get different things. Those are the four pillars of our faith. Yes, the other ones, creation, the millennium, the nature of Christ, those are all, all important as well. But there's four pillars going on and says then number seven doubt as to the holy scriptures do you leave your bible at home when you go to work or whatever you should never leave home without it how many of you leave home without your car keys how about your cell phone i'm bringing these out because one I'm able to because I don't know you all. Correct? Even if I did, I'd still bring it out. Because I love you. I don't say this in hatred. I say this is that God's people are a peculiar people. When you walk into a room, any room, people should know this person's different. They may not know that you're a Seventh-day Adventist right off the bat, but within a few seconds when you start talking to them, they should know you must be a Seventh-day Adventist. Yes, I am. Amen? Amen? Yeah. The way we talk, the way we dress, the way we look at the world and things that are going on, that Christ's return is imminent. Amen. Not what they changed in 2015 is, what was it? They changed it in the 20th fundamental beliefs. Imminent means <coughs> close. close, very close, not soon coming. And I, I'm sorry, I forgot what the wording was. So doubt it to the Holy Scriptures. And then number eight, the downward march to perdition. When the testimonies which were once believed are doubted and given up, Satan knows the deceived ones will not stop at this. And he redoubles his efforts until he launches them into open rebellion, which becomes incurable and ends in destruction. If we follow the same pattern, we may be in a point of being incurable. Incur by giving place to doubts and unbelief in regard to the work of God and by cherishing feelings of distrust and cruel jealousies, they are preparing themselves for complete deception. They rise up with bitter feelings against the ones who dare speak of their errors and reprove their sins. And this is what happened today. I'm not asking for pity. I'm telling you what just happened today. To him that he loves, he do, what does he do with us? Re, the first one is what? Rebuke and chastens. Do you know that, that the word rebuke and chasten means to make us of more value? How many of you have children? You all never corrected your children, did you? You didn't, did you? And they're perfect little saints right now, aren't they? How many of you punish their children 
because you did it in love. My son, 20 years old, he stepped out, so I want to talk about him. Years ago, you know, as he grew growing up, you know, he's hard-headed like me. And one day, he got in trouble, and I said, son, you know, and, I, and, and as we as parents, we always have the famous line, it hurts you more than me. And he's like, yeah, whatever. So I took off my belt and said, you're going to whip me this time. And don't th do this little slinky spanking. I want you to whip me like I whip you. Otherwise, I will turn around and I'll whip you. And so at first he, mm -hmm. I said, Benjamin. He knew. Quack. Come on, Benjamin, you're not done. Whack. And then he started crying. You're not done, Benjamin. Whack. <gasps> I said, you understand, I don't like to do this. But it is necessary to help you to be of more value. Growing up, my mother used to say, son, I want you to be better than me. She was not an analyst growing up. But she did not keep quiet when pastors were saying the wrong thing about the nature of Christ. And she never kept quiet. She, see, if God abhors one sin above another, of which his people are guilty of, is doing nothing in the case of emergency. Indifference and neutrality in, regard, in a religious crisis is regarded by God as the most grievous crime against the courts of heaven. Do you understand that? You being neutral, not inviting people to come and warning them and studying with them, whatever, God abhors. But you doing everything you can, and if people don't heed the call, it's okay. God says, come into the kingdom because you've done everything you can. I'm going to deal with them for refusing to hear or at least study for themselves, correct? Amen? Amen. As we near the close of time, listen again what we are told through Inspiration. Review and Herald, December 23, 1890. Review and Herald, eight, uh, December 23, 1890. She says, one interest will prevail. One subject will swallow up every other. Christ, our righteousness. See, do you want his righteousness? Do you believe in his righteousness? Do you believe what Jude 24 says to him that is able to keep you from falling and to present you how? Faultless. See, we glaze through that, uh, that verse like we know what we're talking about. I don't. I'm trying to understand that. But what a little I understand is that in, in God's power, by God's grace, if I surrender to him, he can keep me from ever sinning again. That's righteousness by faith, isn't it? Do God's people have to reach that before they can go to heaven? How about reach that before the time of trouble? How about reach that before the Sunday law? Yes. We have to reach that, not of our strength or power, but in His might, in His power, correct? The only thing you have, and you don't even have that, is I surrender all. Amen. Here, Lord. In my hand, no price I bring. Simply to the cro cross I cling. Right? Testimony, volume 6, page 42. says, one subject of emulation must swallow up all others. Who will most closely resemble Christ in character? See, that's, that is, should be our theme. Not, not competing with one another. The apostles, or the disciples, actually, when Jesus went back to heaven, and before the outpouring of the Holy Spirit, they were not competing to see who was going to be on the right hand and left. They were wanting to see who would most closely resemble Christ in character. When you and I have that nature, when you and I have that hunger and thirsting after Christ's righteousness, then we will be coming like Christ and near. We will never know, but we will be near and having victories and we will see in miracles and people come into the church like never before. Then you guys are going to have to have outside camp meeting. Amen? Yes. It's not too cold to have an outside camp meeting, is it? People are going to be flocking to the church because they've been hearing things because the Holy Spirit has been using you like never before. But it has to be, we have to have Christ our righteousness. Amen. 
Who will most entirely hide self in Jesus? You know, I really wish that you all could see me. I would have a wall right here. I really wish that you all couldn't even hear me because it's not about the man. It's about the man, Christ Jesus. Correct? It's about hearing his voice. Not me. Not me, but Christ. Herein is my Father glorified. Christ says that ye bear much fruit. You know, people should be able to come to you and if we're bearing much fruit, I like mangoes. Can you all come and pluck the mangoes from my branches? Or am I, am I a sour sap or whatever? So when we come to church, some of us come like, <clears throat> or do we come to church and like, praise God, I'm here. Praise God that I'm here. I am praising God that I'm here. 880 miles. We left, you know, about 7.30. Ran into traffic for the next 40 miles past Wildwood. Then it started pouring down rain until we finally got almost to Nashville. But I was thinking, thank God for your protection. Amen. Yeah. Thank God, Lord. Thank you. And then we drove until about 3 o'clock this morning and stopped somewhere, hotel, and pulled in the parking lot and slept in our car and got up around 6 and then headed on and then all hell broke loose. <laughs> no, literally. And I'm still praising God. That's okay. It's all right, God. You're going to be glorified one way or the other because I know the devil is trying to prevent me to focus, to pray earnestly, to study, prepare for tonight, this weekend. Amen? Prepare, pre you know, Yes, so I praise God. Amen. Why does the devil use the church to destroy the church? Here are two main reasons. I hope you write this down. The devil, one, has no authority. He thinks he has authority. Okay? All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to who? Jesus. Jesus Christ. It's just the battle is going through right now. In Matthew 28, 18 to 20, what are we told? And Jesus came and spake unto them, saying, All power is given unto me in heaven and in earth. Go ye therefore. Are we going? Go ye therefore. And what does the rest of the verse say? You got to teach the people. See, we must, Ministry of Healing, page 143, work like Christ methods. Christ methods alone. You know, Please understand what I'm fixing to say. If somebody is homeless, do they need a great controversy? Do they need a Bible? They need a place to stay. If they're hunger, hungry, do they need steps to Christ? They need food. It says, when I was, I was hungered, you came and gave me a great controversy. You fed me, right? When I was naked, you clothed me. When I was in prison, you visited me. See, if we reach the people where they are and see what their needs are, and you care from the heart. Man, this happened. I, I went uh, there in Benton, Tennessee. It's a conference church. I was helping them trying to go door to door, do, do this little survey, and trying to create Bible studies. And I just announced it. I was there and I announced it, said, you know, next Sabbath I'm going to teach you all how to go door to door. You know, because I had tried to get them to, to let me come and help them in our in this stuff, because the church has you know, been dwindling down. And so I announced it. And then the pastor and the elder and all that showed up that next Sabbath, and I told them what to do, how to answer the question. I said, it's about quality, not quantity. And I said, and we're going to do this for two hours, and here's your assigned streets to go. Well, they all came back, and I said, when you come back in two hours, I want you all to give testimonies. Well, everybody was just excited. Can I, can I go next? Can I go next? And the pastor and his wife, I made them go last, intentionally. And he said, you must have... Know where we're gonna, you know, where you to send me? I said, no. Where'd you go? Well, we had the sidewalk. We just were able to walk down the sidewalk. And they, he was an older gentleman, and oh, just great. And then the, the head elder said, um, "Well, you know, 
we only went to one place and tell me. Well, we met to, met to this one place and knocked on the door and the guy, what do you want? Oh, sir, we're just out here, you know, uh, having, uh, doing a community survey. We just want to, I don't have time for this. Just real hateful. Well, sir, we're just trying to ask, you know, if, if you have any health problems or whatever, we're going to be doing some health lectures here and all that. Well, finally the guy, well, I guess you'll come in. You all can come in. So he came in. They came in. Uh, um, Ron and Carrie. And so they were there for about the whole two hours and came and I said, and what happened? Well, well, we were there. I said, okay, great. I said, you were able to spin. I said, remember I told you it's not quantity, it's quality. Well, the next Sabbath we went out again. And Ron and Carrie went to the same, same man. And because when it was time for, you know, for them to, to, to share, and they said, well, we only went to one place. I said, and what happened? Well, it was the same man we went to last week. And I said, and what happened? Well, and she turned to the other elder and said, well, his mower doesn't work. And, and can, can you, you know, the other elder said, can you fix it? And he's like, well, I don't know if I can fix it, but I'll look at it. And I said, and what happened to you, Carrie? She said, what do you mean? You were caring for the, his heart, meaning you were meeting his needs. Well, they kept going and, and visiting him. And then one Sabbath, he shows up with a card. Went to the receptionist, the, the, the people, you know, give the bulletins and all that, and said, here, please give it to the head elder and his wife, and then turned around and walked off. Well, when the head elder and his wife got it and services were over, they skipped lunch and <laughs> they hightailed it to his place. Well, several months later, I got called. I was in Washington doing meetings in Idaho, Washington, and Oregon, and I, anyways, somewhere for a whole month, and I got a call from the pastor and said, you know, I just want to let you know that such and such here that Rob and Carrie were studying with, he was baptized. I said, well, praise God. And uh, he said, I just want to let you know that uh, at his baptism, uh, he's 79 years old, and he said, this is the best day of my life. He was dying of terminal cancer. But, and I said, if you all had not gone out there, he would not have met Jesus. Amen. See, that's the thing is, we got to get out there and meet people and introduce them to Jesus. Here, I want to introduce you to my best friend. And, you know, however way God means, and I'm just trying to teach principles. We've got to focus on what their needs are. Your neighbors are your best ones right now. Find what their needs. Do they know that you love God with all your heart? That you are Seventh-day Adventists? Let them know that you're there for them if, you need, if they need you. And eventually, when the Holy Spirit, I'm not the Holy Spirit, when only the Holy Spirit tells you, then invite them to have studies with you. Invite them to come church. Correct? The Holy Spirit may tell you and press upon you to go ahead and immediately invite them right then and there. See, if we open up our, our hearts and open up our home and invite people in, and they stink, you know, it's interesting, the Holy Spirit kind of shuts your smelling sense, and you don't smell it. Because why? You love them. You could care less. And then the mud that comes into, in, into your home, ladies, it, it won't really matter because it, it can be replaced. It can be cleaned up, right? Yeah, it, it's okay. It's all good. Number two, why does the devil use the church? Number two, the devil knows our weaknesses, doesn't he? Yeah. He can't get into our minds, but he knows where we are the weakest at. What little trigger the buttons and everything else. And there's three, three weaknesses that he understands. One is lack of endurance toward sound teaching. Many don't like the sound teaching. Oh, you offended me. The pastor offended me. Sound teaching requires us to follow Jesus wholeheartedly. See, that's why he says, I'm a jealous God, because he wants 100% of you. He does not want 99.999% of you, right? Amen. He said, either I'm going to have 100% of you, or I don't want you at all. Amen. That's the key. Matthew 22, 37 says, Jesus said unto him, Thou shalt love the Lord thy God with what? Part of your heart, all your heart, and with all your soul, and with all your mind, mentally, physically, and spiritually, correct? Amen. This is the first and great commandment, isn't it? And the second is like unto, but we kind of yeah, skip that next one. Thou shalt love thy neighbor. Look at the, your neighbor right now. Yeah, left and right, front and back, it's okay. 
We're not doing anything Pentecostal here. <laughs> Do you love that person next to you? Yes. How about across the, the, across the, uh, the aisle? I don't know if you can see this picture that's on the front. A little car uh, caricature that I had here. These people are at church and they, they're <clears throat> and they don't like the people next to them. Pretty sad, isn't it? Yeah. So you have to love your neighbor as thyself on these two commandments hang what? All the law and the prophet. If you don't love God with all your heart, and your neighbor at yourself, I don't care. That's where 1 Corinthians 13, though I speak with the tongues of men of angels that have not Jesus, I'm sound in brass or tingling cymbal, right? Though I have the gift of prophecy and I understand all ministry and all knowledge, but don't have Jesus, what does it profit me? I can sit here and quote you Bible and spirit prophecy, but if I don't have the character of Jesus Christ, what is it going to profit? What does it profit? See, we've got to get back to the basics. And, saw, and ask God, create in me a clean heart and renew thy, your spirit within me. Cast me not away from your sight. When we have the character of Christ, then guess what? Our minds are going to be opened up and then when we read the spirit of prophecy in the Bible, then it's going to hold fast. And then when you go and see someone, you're going to be filled with compassion because Jesus, all he was filled with compassion with everyone he went in contact with, didn't he? Number two, we have itching ears. This is the problem with Seventh-day Adventists, and especially independence, separated, whatever we call ourselves. We have itching ears. We are not happy with the truths that have been established. We want, and I was going to show you this picture, of all the winds of doctrines, the 2520, the, the false prophet from Puerto Rico, you know, head coverings and everything else, the feast days, the Holy Spirit. I've not heard it all possibly. I don't know. Really? Really? And we go down these rabbit trails and we neglect, one, the character of Christ in our lives. Amen. Number two, the first, second, and third angel's message, right? Along, yes, with the health message. I understand that. That is what will transform us. That's what's going to empower our people. Look at this. Listen to this. There, listen. I hope you're listening. Are you all awake? Amen. All right, listen. This, is, this first part is very important. There is no hope for the success of any religious organization where criticism is cherished as a fine art. I need to repeat that. There is no hope for the success of any religious organization where criticism is cherished as a fine art and called spiritual discernment. Oh man, when I read that, I was like, whoa. Men, listen, might far better be blind to others' faults than to be inspired with a that keen detective spirit that will watch for defects in those whom the Lord loves and through whom he works. We all need to humble ourselves not to have an elevated idea of self. You have not come up to my spiritual level. Is that the same page? Same, same page, page. Yeah, I'm not, yeah, the same paragraph. See? I had one person came up to me and I, I knelt and I had one knee down, one knee up and I was kneeling on it and they came up to me after prayer and says, Pastor, why don't you kneel on both uh, knees? And I said, why did you have your eyes open? <laughs> You're watching how I kneel? Really? Seriously? <sighs> I had another gentleman year, years ago, he was a former Catholic, came up to me and he's, I, was done, I was done with preaching, and he said, um, Pastor, I just, and he had this little note all folded up and handed it to me, and he said, just whenever you have time, just read it. Oh, really? And so I read it right then and there. And he quoted from the Spirit of Prophecy, where Ellen White, remember the man came up to have prayer, and she, he was standing, and she grabbed a hold of his jacket and says, who are you to stand before the king of the universe? It will do much for the congregation to know that you have a... Uh, reverence for the king of the universe. 
And, and that hit me like the Holy Spirit had a sledgehammer and went, Kaboom! I didn't know. And I had been in ministry for a year or two that I was supposed to kneel every time when we are in worship. But his wife, I called her criticizing, uh, uh, criticizing, correcting, critical criticizing, correcting Corinthia. And every time she came up to me, Pastor, I need to speak with you. I don't want your blood on my hands. This wall went up. Didn't matter what she said. See, it's all in how we share with one another. Pray for that, Lord, please. As I go share this with Pastor Ben, help him to be receptive and give me the words because, you know, I, I don't know how to say this because I saw something he did or what have you. And if, you know, if I have that spirit of, I want to know, I don't know everything. Do you know everything? Oh, we're all learning in grace, aren't we? We're learning together. And if we do, do it that way, then the, the Spirit of God will work in both of us. And we were like, thank you. And I told Brother Pierre, I said, Brother Pierre, thank you. That did more for me and the way he did it. He rebuked and chastened me. And I accepted that. Lose sight of all others except Christ, she goes on and says. We want Christ in our humanity. And Christ wants to abide in us. We are human and fallible. Every one of us, and unless Christ is formed within the hope of glory, we shall make wonderful blunders in estimating our fellow workers according to our pattern and measurement. Who's the pattern? Jesus. Christ Jesus. Don't compare you with him. Compare yourself with him. God sees beneath the surface. He sees all good, and he marks all the evil. Leave to him the work of passing judgment on your brethren. Have a care for the young men. Listen, have a care for the young men and women who are now forming their characters. If the you know, young people see us fighting, what do they think of Christianity? I don't want to have nothing to do with this eternal gospel church. All they do is bicker and fight and everything else, cut each other, stab each other. <laughs> Converse with them and help them all you possibly can. Let no one educate the young men and young women in the science of picking flaws. Let me read that again. Let no one, how many? Zero. Educate the young men and young women in the science of picking flaws. Let not the youth hear you finding fault with those who do not please your fancy. The youth are Christ's servants to be cared for and to be encouraged in good, pure, holy thoughts. They, listen, they need no lessons in evil surmising. Satan stands ready to instruct them in this line. And see, here's the thing is, those of us that are not heeding the simple message here, and we just want to ignore it, you will continue to make perfect shipwreck of your faith and you will pull other with you down. And you, you and I will be held accountable for this. She says, teach them to be kind, to respect and love one another, as Christ loved us. Keep the perfume, the perfume, and I want you to keep that in mind, the perfume of Christ's character in your own words and actions. The perfume. When you walk in, do you have a sweet-smelling Savior? Amen? Number three, we have selfish passions. He sees that. We are good in pursuing our, our passions, but tend to be lacking in fo focusing on God and the things of God. This is why financially, the work of God is stunted. But guess what? At the day of Pentecost, who funded the work back then? Joseph of Arimathea. Yes, yeah, the Holy Spirit, but Joseph of Arimathea that was on the, on the, on the wrong side you know, uh, Nicodemus, they were very wealthy. And then when Paul, a couple of years later, when he was converted, he funded, he was very wealthy. But then most of it came from the Corneliuses and others that accepted the faith. And they're like, well, you know, what do, what do I need? Because see, the disciples believed that Jesus was going to come back in their very time. That's why these 12 men 
turn the world upside down. They had been with Jesus. They had realized they were bickering and arguing everything else. Who was going to be the greatest and everything? Jealousy. And then when they were converted, then there was a total transformation in their character. And they see, saw Jesus go up. And the angel said in Acts chapter 1, Ye men of Galilee, why stand ye gazing up into heaven? This same Jesus which you have seen taken up into heaven will like in what? Manner come back as you see him come. And the, when they got that message, really? <gasps> go, they, remind, they were reminded, go ye therefore and teach all nations. Oh, if we teach everybody and spread the gospel everywhere, then Jesus is going to come back right in our time, right? What if we took that attitude right here? I want to tell you something. Jesus is going to come back before many of us are going to die. I'm not predicting. I'm not going to sit and predict in five years, whatever. But I will predict that many of us that are here will still be alive when Jesus comes. I pray that we're on the right side. Amen? Amen? There's things moving in quick succession in this world. And as we, if we realize that, then we will see the urgency. Remember, now, I want you to go with me and close in Romans chapter 10. Romans chapter 10. So I'm closing. Romans chapter 10. Look at this. Look at what Paul tells us in Romans 10. Romans chapter 10, verse 1. Are we there? Are we there? Remember, don't, don't come to church tomorrow without your Bible. And that doesn't mean your phone. Someday, one day, your battery's going to run out and you're going to be in the cave, so where is going to be your Bible? Yeah. Thy word have I. So hide it there. Look at verse 1. Brethren, this is Paul. Paul is writing this roughly around 64 A.D. He's in Rome. He's in prison. So he's writing this in Rome. Okay? Brethren, my heart's desire and prayer to God for who? Now who's modern Israel now? Yeah. Seventh-day Adventists. This is actually in reference to his conference of his day. The conference church of his day. My says, brethren, my heart's desire and prayer to God for Israel is that they may be what? Do you have that heart and desire for our brethren, Seventh-day Adventists that are in the conference? Amen. You have that desire for those that are not of the faith yet? Amen. Amen. See, look, for I bear them record that they have a zeal of God, but not according to what? Knowledge. See, Paul understood I had the zeal. That's why he was persecuting the, God's people, the Christians. But then when Jesus appeared to him and he gained knowledge, then his knowledge and his zeal were changed 180, wasn't it? Amen. That's why we study this, the word of God and the spirit of prophecy, that we may gain knowledge. And I, I'm hoping that you all have the zeal. If not, I'm going to pray for you to have the zeal. I hope you guys you know, have a fire under your feet that you guys are just moving like never before. Amen. Get the books out there. Yes, pray for people. Educate them in the, in the principles of hell. Do whatever it takes. I'm not the Holy Spirit. Let's, I'm just wanting the Holy Spirit to direct you. When we leave this camp, I don't want us to be the same. But in Romans chapter 12, 1 and 2, I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of the God, that you present your bodies, what? A living sacrifice, holy and acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service. Be not Deformed. I put deformed on there, so it's okay with you all. Be not deformed to this world, but be ye transformed by how? The renewing your mind that you may know that good and perfect will of God. That your zeal will be added knowledge of God. And by the combination, you will be a power that Satan can't even withstand. Amen? If we can possibly kneel together in prayer. Precious Father in heaven, we're so thankful for you that you are on the throne still. There is still some probationary time for all of us to hit the mark, the character of Jesus Christ. 
We ask that you will please rebuke the devil that he will not have any entrance or leeway during these meetings this weekend or ever again in our lives. We seek you now while you are found, be, be able to be found. We ask, Father, for the knowledge that will be added to our zeal, that we will be willing to do and to dare like never before for Christ, that you can use us, your people, which are called by your name, that you will empower us, and that our family, our friends, our neighbors can know that we have been with Christ. So pour your spirit again. We don't want just a measure. We want double measure. We want quadruple measure. Whatever it takes of his power and his grace, God and direct us as we go to sleep that we may have the rest that we need, the peace that we need. Come back tomorrow in the morning to be able to worship you in spirit and in truth. And Father, I pray that things that I said was what you want me to say, not my words, but thine. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen.